Saskatchewan. Start somewhere inside its borders, pick a direction, and you can drive for hours without ever leaving. A land as vast and varied as its rich history. It doesn't matter where you begin or where you end. It doesn't matter if you're moving or standing still. The place will come to you. It will whisper to you. It will tell you stories. It's a place full of stories. Stories of culture, stories of survival, stories of accomplishment, and stories of people. It will capture your imagination. It will become a part of you. It will move you. From one time or another, there have been those who've scanned Saskatchewan's endless horizon for their place in the story. They're the ones who heard the sounds of distant voices resting upon foreign shores. The ones who looked to the stars for a place to leave a legacy. The ones who built bridges over vast oceans. They are the ones who found the world to be a place beyond borders. She used to say to my children, if you want to be happy and see the world, go out and do it because she said the world doesn't come to your doorstep. Gladys Arnold, newspaper reporter and world traveler, began her life in 1905 as the daughter of a station agent in rural Saskatchewan. They ended up moving a lot of times. She said she moved 16 times in 12 years, which helped to enhance her love for books and writing because she said she really didn't have a lot of time to make long-term friends. Gladys's passion for the printed word led her to take on a job at the Regina Leader Post in 1930. Initially, she was an administrator, but her sights were set on a different goal. Her love was to be a reporter, so she spoke to the editor and pleaded with him that she would like an opportunity to try being a reporter, but at that time it was dominated by men and women were not reporters. Eventually, after a few months of prodding with the editor, he allowed her to do a social column that sort of covered social teas and nice events for ladies in the city. In 1935, Gladys became intrigued by the political and social climate in Europe. As a result, she left her job at the Leader Post to travel abroad. People didn't really understand what communism was or fascism or what Hitler was doing over there. And her desire when she went over there was to get to the bottom of it. Traveling with a few belongings and a typewriter, Gladys's first stop was England. When she got to London, she wasn't comfortable there, so she took off to Paris. And being that my great-grandmother had a French background, she sort of felt an association with Paris. She knew she was home. While overseas, Gladys began to work as a freelance reporter in order to support herself. And started sending stories home to the Leader Post and to various places, and then eventually was taken on as the official war correspondent for the Canadian press and that's where her whole career sort of took off. While covering the war, Gladys interviewed such influential people as Charles de Gaulle and Winston Churchill. She also wrote about the effect the war was having on women and children. After the Allied victory in Europe, Gladys returned to Canada where she worked faithfully for the Free French Organization, a group committed to assisting and restoring war-torn France. She went across Canada on speaking engagements to every major city and she went to Washington and met with Mrs. Roosevelt privately. She gave her the story that France needed some assistance to get back on their feet again. Gladys's work for the Free French resulted in a Legion of Honor award from the French government and a position at the French Embassy in Ottawa. At the end of her life, Gladys Arnold had traveled to 60 different countries. Her legacy lives on through two scholarships which she established at the University of Regina, one for journalism and one for French. Aurora Borealis, commonly referred to as the Northern Lights, can be seen more frequently in Saskatchewan than any other place on the planet. That's one of the reasons SED Systems was initially set up at the University of Saskatchewan in 1965. 
The initial work of SED was to build rocket payloads and balloon payloads that were used for doing upper atmospheric research. The various effects that the northern lights might have on communication systems as an example. At first, SED Systems was called the Space and Engineering Division, part of the university's Institute of Space and Atmospheric Studies. In 1972, the organization became a private company and changed its focus to ground stations. One of their first ground-based operations was the conversion of a Prince Albert radar station. We were involved in converting this radar facility into a receiving facility for remote sensing data. It was actually one of the first stations in the world to receive data from the American satellite Landsat when the satellite was first launched back in 1972. Since then, SED Systems has focused on supplying telecommunications markets with product services that impact our everyday lives. If you make a phone call from here to overseas somewhere, the traffic may actually be going through a communications satellite. Remote sensing satellites may be used for monitoring agricultural crops. It's actually used to set the prices of commodities on international markets because you can see how much is growing here compared to how much is growing somewhere else. Banking machines, etc., are hooked up internationally via communication satellites. So the systems that SED is building are really part of those programs and in that sense are, are used by people on a day-to-day -day basis even if they don't know it. The company also offers monitoring, controlling, and testing services for satellites, such as RadarSat-1. RadarSat is a Canadian remote sensing satellite, again, that's used to take pictures of the Earth, this time using radar instead of taking optical images. Our involvement in that was providing the systems that are used to control the satellite on orbit and make sure that it's operating properly. SED actually flies that satellite for the Canadian Space Agency. While SED Systems has been involved in many Canadian projects, the company conducts approximately 80% of its business with international customers, including a huge contract with the European Space Agency. We're building some very, very large antenna systems for them. They're 35 meters in diameter when they're completed. They stand about as tall as a 12-story building, actually. These antennas are used to send signals out to deep space probes. SED has achieved national and international success but is still based in Saskatoon. We have about 220 people working for us. Most of them, incidentally, are hired locally, so we think it's a good opportunity for young engineers and software people, etc., and technicians to find good, meaningful, and, and exciting employment right here at home instead of having to move somewhere else. Since launching its first rocket payload in 1967, SED Systems has established itself as an innovative leader in the communications industry. The future for this landmark Saskatchewan company looks stellar. He had a distinct philosophy of people working together. And he was able to communicate that philosophy very effectively. Lauren Dietrich, longtime leader in the cooperative movement and pioneer in cooperative farming, was born in 1915 in Saskatoon. Dietrich's family farmed 10 miles south of Saskatoon until they moved to Leroy in 1927. Lauren's father and mother and the whole family were very much interested in the cooperative philosophy. And I'm sure that Lauren got his start in that kind of a way. Working alongside his parents, Dietrich embraced the idea of cooperatives. One of his first accomplishments was becoming the first manager of the Leroy Cooperative Association in 1939. Dietrich held that position until 1941. In 1943, his involvement in cooperatives was put on hold while he served in the Royal Canadian Navy during the war. As a returning veteran, Dietrich qualified for an agricultural initiative spearheaded by the Saskatchewan Department of Cooperation. The particular method that was proposed was through cooperative farming. And I held my first meeting with a group of veterans at the School of Agriculture, and Lauren was at that meeting. Dietrich was sold on the idea of co-op farming and helped to establish the Matador Cooperative Farm in 1946. It was settled on provincial land in the Matador area north of Swift Current. Lauren was elected president of the cooperative, and he held that post for, well, for many years. On the farm, the members shared both the work and decision-making according to their skill and expertise. There were no buildings, so they were able to buy an old airport building just north of Swift Current 
and they sawed it into sections and moved it up to the farm site. Out of that, they built four homes and built a community building that the other fellows lived in. Just as the members shared in the work, they also shared in the profits. When the books were balanced, whatever the surplus was, it was divided among the fellows, sort of in proportion to the amount of work that they provided. Dietrich's work on the Matador farm and passion for co-ops opened the door for him to become the first chairman of the Saskatchewan Federation of Production Cooperatives in 1948. Other ventures that Dietrich helped to create were the Matador Trading Cooperative and the Cooperative Trust Company. As well as being a promoter of co-ops in Saskatchewan, Dietrich brought his knowledge to the international farming community. In a number of countries where farms were small, and where they needed help, both with regard to technology of farming, as well as organization. He was able to be helpful to them. Dietrich devoted much of his time to relations with China. His efforts helped build Canadian relations with that nation. In 2000, Dietrich was awarded the Saskatchewan Order of Merit for his dedication and leadership in the Saskatchewan Cooperative Movement. Beyond the borders of our world lie the depths of our mind. A whole universe contained within the imaginations of our own individual selves. The place we go when the well runs dry. The well we feel when we're feeling fine. The trouble we have when the fuses are blown. There was one fellow named Winston. He always wore a Boy Scout uniform. And one time, Tommy Douglas came and Winston asked, said, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Tommy Douglas, the premier of this province. Winston says, oh, that's okay, you can come in. There's a lot of people here that think they're Napoleon and Jesus and everything else. When the Weyburn Mental Hospital opened in 1921, it was one of the largest buildings in the entire British Empire. At the time, mental illness was poorly understood and the primary methods of treatment consisted of work and water. A lot of the treatments were to do with prolonged baths, and water is quite therapeutic in many ways. Other treatments used at the hospital were not so benign. In an attempt to control and treat patients, insulin therapy, electroshock, and lobotomies were practiced. These treatments were driven by a desperate need to help patients who were often a danger to themselves and others. Later, other therapies came into practice. They did have art therapy and occupational therapy and music therapy, things like that. A lot of them worked at the laundry and in the kitchen and in the garden. They were just glad to have things to do. In 1951, Dr. Humphrey Osmond and Dr. Abram Hoffer came to the Weyburn Mental Hospital to research the connection between schizophrenia and LSD. They wanted to see what it was like to be schizophrenic and not have a good grasp on reality. Osmond coined the term psychedelic to describe mescaline and LSD. He was not only a great person, but he knew how to get money to sort of get that hospital cleaned up and get the floors and get some washers and dryers and things on the unit and have people looked after in a little bit more individual sort of a way. In 1957, the Weyburn Mental Hospital received international recognition from the American Psychiatric Association. By the 1960s, attitudes began to change. Most of the patients from the hospital were placed in community-based programs. By February 2005, only 50 patients remained. Weyburn really was on the cutting edge of treatment. It was sort of state-of-the-art, and a lot of good things happened that people aren't really aware of. People were taught more about the therapeutic use of self, and you know, how you could work with people and form relationships. In 2005, the mental hospital was slated for demolition, ending an association of more than 80 years with the Weyburn community. Pop culture has a way of letting you know that you've arrived. You've transcended something beyond the borders of what has come and gone. You've been given a special place in the language 15 minutes past the hour. You're the one they all came to see. What do you get when you mix one cup of butter, a cup of sugar, three eggs, a pinch of salt, two tablespoons of cream, one teaspoon soda, two teaspoons baking powder, half a teaspoon ground cardamom, 
and three cups of flour, an international phenomenon that started right here in Saskatchewan. Girl Guide Cookies. Girl Scouts, as they're called in the United States, certainly picked it up from Canada. In 1927, Dutch immigrant Christina Riepseman needed a way to raise money to send a group of Girl Guides to camp. She decided to use her culinary skills in an enterprising way. My grandmother was a great cook. She baked them in her kitchen and she would put a dozen in a bag and they would sell them for 10 cents and they would have enough money to take the train to go out to camp. Girl Guide Cookie Sales help support the largest women's organization in the world. And that's just one more reason to be proud of this home-baked Saskatchewan story. The history of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders stretches back to 1910 and the formation of the Regina Rugby Club. In 1923, the club competed for its first Grey Cup, but lost to Queen's University. One year later, the team was nicknamed the Rough Riders. Big effort was made to make sure that the entire province came to understand that this was their team. This was representing Saskatchewan. And that is when the Saskatchewan Rough Riders became a provincially owned nonprofit organization. Over the years, fans have connected with the Riders for a number of reasons. Part of the big reason for the success of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders has been their ability to get players who are from Saskatchewan to play with the team, to run the team, to be general manager of the team. In the 30s and 40s, many local players brought fans to watch the team. In the 1950s, Doug Killo, a Regina athlete, starred for the team. Into the modern day times when you had the Roger Aldags and the Bob Polies who came into Regina from very, very small towns, but they kept that hometown flavor about this team. Many Rough Riders stars came from outside of the province, but connected with the fans and the province in a permanent way. The fans are the Rough Riders' secret weapon and part of the reason the Riders are feared on home turf. Teams used to hate coming into Regina and playing the Rough Riders, particularly in the 50s and the 60s. Because in those days, if they sold out all the seats, their policy was they would never turn a fan away at the gate. Well, there was nothing comfortable about that for any player from another team to have those fans right on top of you like that because they gave it to them pretty good. Rider fans are also a presence away from home. We've got people all over this country who've left this province, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, Toronto, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, especially Calgary, it's just like a home game. I mean, those stands are just a big sea of green. It gives them a chance to sort of remember their roots in a, in a kind of a colorful way. Although the riders have been to the Grey Cup 15 times, they've won only twice. For rider fans, Saskatchewan has often been next year country. But still, their fierce pride and support of their team has been unwavering. What the Saskatchewan Rough Riders do for the people of this province gives Saskatchewan a national identity. We can stand up to Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, all these big places, and put something out there on the field that is as good or better than anybody else. Time actually came to the game a little late in the day. Before time, there was an element overtime, an intangible fraction of a second before all ages, beyond all borders. They left footprints in the sands flowing through the hourglass. They were playing the game before anyone ever thought to keep score. When asked to name typical Saskatchewan animals, most people would answer deer, beaver, or gopher, maybe even a cow. But millions of years ago, the typical animals were far different. Plesiosaurs, Triceratops, and even Tyrannosaurus rex. It's not like Jurassic Park where you take a brush and you know, uncover the skeleton in an afternoon and voila, you're done. There's not much in the way of romance in it. It's a lot of grunt work, it's a lot of field work, it's a lot of sweat, blood, and tears. The most celebrated find in Saskatchewan by far is Scotty, the Tyrannosaurus rex. The Tyrannosaurus rex, that's commonly known as Scotty, was first found by then school teacher Robert Gephardt from East End. Robert had asked to join us on a prospecting trip. That first morning that he came out with us, we'd all split up into little areas and then Robert had called us over and said he had found a few bones. The discovery of Scotty was only the beginning. Years of excavation and preservation followed. It took us on and off 
10 years to get the skeleton out of the hill. The rock surrounding the bone is so hard and so cemented to the bone that we had to use air hammers and jack hammers to, to separate these blocks. Most of Scotty's remains, as well as a wide variety of other fossils, are showcased in East End's T-Rex Discovery Centre. Much of the early exploration for fossils in Saskatchewan occurred during the establishment of the boundary between Canada and the U.S. back in the late 19th century. Many fossils were collected but weren't really studied. One of the local residents of this community, though, also had an interest in fossils, and that was Harold Corky Jones, who lived here for 70 plus years. Although Corky Jones had no formal education as a paleontologist, he made some impressive finds, such as a Triceratops skull and a Torosaurus crest, the only one known in Canada. He started establishing contact with the Eastern Institution to identify what these fossils were. There was this mutual relationship that was occurring. At the same time, what's now the Royal Saskatchewan Museum took more of a front role in collecting and identifying fossils of the province. Since then, paleontologists have made many significant discoveries across the prairies. In 1991, I discovered a 20 plus foot marine crocodile north of Melfort, Saskatchewan. We've been collecting other marine reptiles a little bit younger than this from the Lake Diefenbaker area. While much has been discovered about Saskatchewan's noteworthy past, there are always new mysteries to be unearthed. Every summer we go out, walk the hills, and we try and find fossils. What the provinces should be so proud of is that we do have a very rich fossil resource in Saskatchewan, and it's that what keeps us going. Beer, the international language of hay, the game's on. The storied well you turn to when the tears need a place to drown. The beer in there done that a friendship. The glasses of classes, the taste of a place living well beyond the borders of a means to an end. The beer of a place. This place. Saskatchewan. We're very pleased to be able to produce a world-class, internationally recognized group of beers and still be able to call Saskatchewan our home. The Great Western Brewery is a success story that nearly didn't happen. In 1989, after two of Canada's largest beer makers merged, the Carling O'Keefe Brewery in Saskatoon was supposed to be shut down. But some of the employees didn't see closure as an option. A group of employees banded together and tried to achieve what was considered then the impossible. They approached the Molson Breweries about acquiring this set of assets to begin a brewing company. Recently, Great Western was recognized as one of the 50 best managed companies in Canada. We have won many awards for our brewing excellence. We are brewing a quality of beer that can stand up to the best of the world today. Great Western also prides itself by concentrating on the details of brewing. Our size of brewery lends itself to still being very close to the process. So our team of craftsmen are able to very carefully select ingredients and ensure that brewing and bombing process is very well done each and every time. In the final analysis, every company, including Great Western, is only as good as the people who work there. Our employees love to live in Saskatchewan, and so we're very fortunate that we can attract that group of employees to produce some world-class beer. And we see that the future holds nothing but great promise. The light at the end of the tunnel, the thought that came from nowhere, the measure by which we see, all of them found in a province named Saskatchewan, a place everywhere beyond borders. <laughs>